If you can give everybody that you work with this sense that they have capability and capacity and then support them, sometimes when they don't, then you get a spectacular results at the other end. Business of Architecture, episode 344. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for structuring your architecture practice so that you can do your best work more often. Today, I speak with Australian architect Nicole Hodman. Over 15 years ago, Nicole and architect Brian Miller started a small education provider called Practicing Architecture that specializes in professional development programs for architects specifically, helping emerging architects pass the Australian Architecture Practice Examination. I was fascinated by their business model, wanted to have Nicole here on the show, and today you'll discover how Nicole and Brian have developed one of the most influential practice courses in Australia that is helping younger architects get registered. You'll also learn about Nicole's intentional business model that allows her to work on the parts of the design projects that she finds most fulfilling. You're going to love my conversation today with Nicole Hodman. And with that, here is today's show. Hello, Nicole, and welcome to the Business of Architecture. Hello, Enoch. Well, thank you very much for having me here. It's fantastic to have you. And I'm really interested to talk to you about the Practicing Architecture program how it came about. Can you tell us in your own words what it is? The Practicing Architecture Program, or PARC, as it's known um, amongst attendees, uh, is a program really to prepare uh, candidates for what's called the Architecture Practice Exam, which is the licensing exam that we do in Australia. In Australia, you are uh, unable to call yourself an architect until you have a license. So it, that's the purpose of its preparation for that exam and obviously that's a serious exam and um, uh, the last really the last professional step uh, for most people because um, people may go on to further study and things but this is really this is their ticket that's it they've done everything they can tell their mum and dad they finished it and hang the certificate on the wall and they're done so there's something um, lovely about being part of that so that's the purpose of of the tutorials and and yeah, what they're for. Wonderful. I, I remember when I took my licensing exams in the United States, and you're right, it was just such a huge milestone. It's just such a big thing in architecture's career because you finally have that uh, the stamp. Now, most of our listeners are U.S.-based, although we do have a, a worldwide listenership, and I have to confess my ignorance about the, uh, the process to getting registered in Australia, and I would love to understand what are the steps for an Australian architect to practice architecture. So there are, there's a couple of different pathways to registration, but the typical pathway uh, is um, you need to be at least two years postgraduate. So you need at least two years worth of um, experience. That, uh, that experience doesn't have to just be in Australia. You may know that Australians are wonderful nomads and we like to go and see the rest of the planet before we come back home. So some of that experience can be undertaken internationally. Uh, and the actual exam itself is in three parts. There is a logbook or experience component where you need to log hours and put a statement together about your experience. That is then assessed. It's like a series of gates. So once you're through that gate, you are eligible to set a, uh, it's described as a written exam. It's in fact done on a computer. Uh, so there's a, a textbook exam that is closed book. And then there is an interview so the third step's an interview, and once you've done that interview with two sort of senior members of the profession, then you are entitled to register. Now, Australia is a, a federation of states, so we have um, state-based registration, and in order that everyone doesn't go mad, they've got one single process, and once you have... Um, once you have gone through that exam, you are then have the eligibility criteria to register. So it's a little bit like an electronic bus pass. Once you have the electronic bus pass, you have to activate the pass wherever you want to travel. So if you want to work in um, Victoria, which is where my hometown is, in Melbourne, 
uh, you register in Victoria. If you want to work across the border in New South Wales in Sydney, then you need to register there as well. So that's the way that it operates. I got it. That's very clear. Uh, very similar to the United States, which, as you mentioned, is, is also, a, we might call it a confederation of states. And so we have state jurisdictions and similar thing where you sit on the exam that's a standardized exam and then you get licensed per state and then you become eligible to get what we call reciprocal registration in other states. It sounds like ours might be a little bit more tedious because our states actually have different requirements based on the state to get that. So I'm not sure if that's the same in Australia or do they have things working out as efficiently, more efficiently than we do, meaning that it's it's easier and more streamlined. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to use the word more efficient. It would be entirely inappropriate. <laughs> okay. um, it is... It is more, um, so each each jurisdiction, each state has a, a registration board and that registration board sets the rules of registration in that state. They're fairly similar because, the, I mean, essentially those boards, much like the US, are consumer protection boards. And so they are interested in making sure that the consumer is safe. They're not really about architects, though we like to think they are. Um, so the purpose of that um that, so the rules that they have cover similar things like they want all of the architects to have some kind of professional indemnity insurance so that if they make a mistake then the person who's affected by that mistake can um, recover financially um, and it's not reliant on whether the architect themselves have money behind them so your insurance is required uh, professional development is required we've just recently had uh, in the last couple of years a few buildings in Victoria as they have around the world um, in a you know catch on fire and crack and do things that aren't good for the consumer and uh, that has that generated the requirement um, for a, a building competence report that was put together a couple of years ago and there's been some knock-on effect of that to do with the state uh, and federal legislation changing and tightening up so that I think we'll see much more uniformity but it is much like the state's not not the same everywhere. I see. Okay. So you mentioned that the first step would be, uh, after graduation, would be uh, cataloging the time spent uh, in the profession in, 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 in a, a logbook of some sort, and then that there's a review process, and you mentioned different phases for that, uh, the last one being an interview, the second one being the written portion, as you mentioned, on computer, and the first one, I, I assume, was the, uh, the, the, the experience requirement, correct? Who sits on the board of a review or who are the people that are actually reviewing, for example, the experience? Are these volunteers, architects, or are these professional people on the board? Uh, so there's a couple of, in order to make this, this single pathway, all of the boards created a body that doesn't have any legal teeth, but it, it's an organisation that sets up the pathway on behalf of all the boards. And then it, all the states and territories uh, have their I'm going to call them paid volunteers. They don't get paid anywhere near what they're worth, but they uh, have a convener of examiners, as they call them for every state and territory. And each of those, those conveners get together and set the content of the exam and they prepare the interviewers and train the interviewers to interview and examine the candidates in part three and set the general uh, rules for the experience, documenting the experience component. So uh, because... I mean, we've just had this round of candidates uh, go through this. Um, they went through it once, this round, which is unusual because we were concerned about, well, they were concerned about putting everyone in examination rooms because of what's going on in the background. Uh, so there's quite a lot of candidates that went through, so they need quite a lot of examiners. Um, and there's probably a 10 to 1 ratio of examiners to candidates so there's a wow. big cross-section and they spend yeah. quite a lot of time making sure that the candidate um, the demographics of the examiner pool they're trying to map that to the demographics of the candidate pool it doesn't mean if um, uh, you are a um, a candidate with um, a Chinese heritage it doesn't mean your examiner will have Chinese heritage but it means that they're trying to keep it um, reflective of the cohort that's going through, which I think is quite thoughtful of them. Yeah, that makes sense. 
That makes sense. Interesting. And tell me about the practicing architecture program. So this is, as you mentioned, it's something that helps, I assume, with the part two, the registration portion uh, of the registration portion, which would be the, the written exam. How did it come about? Uh, long ago, um, before the internet, when I was... Um, long, long time ago. <laughs> long, okay. long ago. <laughs> um, when I was starting... Um, at, so the Institute ran a similar course. The Institute of Architects in Australia ran a similar course. And I was um, one of the people taking the um, de tutors in the contract administration end of things. And when we finished, a colleague and I were uh, approached by a group of students and said, look, what you did um, made a lot of sense to us. Is there any chance you could do something privately with us? And so we said, sure. And um, that was about or oh, nearly 18 years ago now. So it really started there. Uh, and we then built a program that essentially it's it's all the bits that don't make you interesting at dinner parties. It's all the bits that are the unsexy bits. So it's not design, though I'm going to have something to say about it not being about design. It's not design, but it, we go through from regulatory structure, which was the, the boring story I told you before about states and federation, through um, liability, through how to have a good contract with your client, how to manage consultants, um, and then how to the briefing process, uh, how to manage a budget, which is always one that we struggle with as architects. Um, how, and then through uh, different procurement models and then through administering a contract, so dealing with a contractor on site. So we sort of go from the front of the process to the back and there's a series of modules uh, on that, um, which cover all of the um, part of the pathway, we have a national standard competencies for architects, which is essentially a list of things architects need to be able to do. And so it responds to all of those competencies, excluding the design competencies. So um, that's the process. That's what's in it. Got it. And is the design competency, is that tested in any way? It uh, only with respect to um, ma making sure that your design meets the regulatory requirements. Um, because the, um, I think the, the general thought amongst the people who uh, put together the registration process is that your degree is there to uh, teach you about design and, and all of the components of design. Um, and that this process is more about, um, yes, protecting the consumer. Now, I have to say that good design protects the consumer. But it's also... Um, Another element of the assessment, which is also what we talk about, is the ethics of design and being an ethical designer. So whilst that's not talking about design itself, it is talking about how to um, how do you approach the world if you've got a developer who wants you to maximise a site uh, in a way that is uh, not going to contribute in any way to the overall urban environment, um, should you say yes? to do you give them exactly what they want and there's you know uh, that there are many people have many debates about context and all those sorts of things so whilst we don't get very deep into that we do talk about how that's an integrally important component so the idea of professionalism and ethics floats as an undercurrent through all of the different modules that we do i see what would you say for aspiring australian architects what would be the top things that, top tips you would give them about passing the registration examination? <sighs> passing the examination. Um, one of my top tips would be, uh, it's is to consolidate your knowledge. Um, one of the things that, the reason that our course is, I guess, been so successful and, and, and helpful, according to the people doing it, is that, uh, learning the sort of things that we teach in the tutorials it's very difficult to teach it at university because it's a bit like trying to learn how to drive a car from a book you've actually got to be in the car otherwise you can't feel it you can't um you know be sitting and traveling oh i've got to change gears and my indicator at the same time oh what do i do so i think that you need to be in it you need to be driving the car for a bit before you attempt the license you need to really um have put yourself in that role and that's not always easy 
because you're not always the master of your own destiny when you're young and you're starting off in a practice. So I think that there's something about um, not getting too distracted about working for famous people, I think would be one of my top tips because one of the things... What do you mean by that? Yeah, what do you mean by that? One of my... uh, One of the things is that often you get the best experience when you're working for someone who's playing golf, who is not... who doesn't have a very tight grip on their business or their... um, on, on wanting to control things. We're, architects naturally love to control things, otherwise we'd be doing something else. Uh, so if you have someone who is very controlling at the top of the overall business, it means that you often can't m- wriggle outside of where you've been located in the business. And that means you get a particular kind of experience and there's not a lot of diversity in that. So my suggestion would be certainly work for famous people. I have, it's very exciting, but also work for some people that aren't sitting under an enormous brand because they may be operating in a in a different way and um that that getting that diversity of experience i think is really important so don't rush get a get try to get a diversity of experience and in a diversity of um procurement models so um that means that you may be located sometimes the client may be your your client may be the the building owner or the person who wants the building and sometimes it's really good to work for the contractor to work contractor side um just to see how you know why is it that contractors in australia call architectural drawings cartoons perhaps it's a good idea to get behind there and work out what's the contractor's agenda what do they care about and then um something I like to call the architectural design Trojan horse. If you can have something that looks like something the contractor wants, but have tucked inside of it some really nice design, then you can get really nice design and what the contractor wants at the same time. So um, seeing from the other side, I think has value as well. So I would, many different goggles, uh, I think, gives the, gives uh, young architects an opportunity to also see where they want to fit into the world. As you know, we're all different shaped jigsaw puzzle pieces and if we can find our spot in the jigsaw where we're natively happy, then it we don't it doesn't it don't have to struggle quite as hard as one might otherwise. Yeah, and I'm I'm just curious speaking of the jigsaw puzzle, if you don't mind sharing, where have you found yourself to fall within that puzzle? Well, my uh, something I learned about myself fairly early on, architecture is a, is a, takes a very long time. And it's quite easy to get um, project fatigue on one project. So particularly working on big uh, civic projects, which I find very interesting, the more complex, the better. That's my favourite part of the world. But they take a very long time, which means you might do five or six of them in your life if you are deeply embedded in the project. So um, I realised having done one or two of those that actually I need a bit more diversity. So my jigsaw puzzle has um, a number of different facets. There's this, there's the teaching part. Um, uh, my business now I've rebuilt in order to be able to work. Um, so when work comes to me, I automatically set up a joint venture with a practice that I think is interesting in order to deliver that work. And the reason that I do that is because I want to be around a diversity of minds and a diversity of approaches. And I find that for me, it means I I can mix up that project fatigue because I'm not working with the same team all the time or the same mindset or the same approach. And so that's, I guess, a combination of being able to do that. And then that gives me enough room to be able to teach and um, work on another little project that I'm doing with a colleague of mine who um, uh, did some work at Harvard um, on your in your part of the side of the world um, on manufactured housing and how manufactured housing may be uh, useful for providing housing at a lower cost point. But that's that's very embryonic, and a lot of people are looking at that. Got it. 
do you, do you care to share more or is it trade secret information that uh, we can't talk about now? I'm curious about that venture. Uh, it, it's really about, um, and I'm, I'm sure that, that it's what everybody's thinking about at the moment. So it's not um, a special secret. It's really about uh, the idea of creating a, a kit of parts where you can um, jump on a website in the same way that there are websites where you can build your own website. The idea of jumping onto a website and being able to build your own small building and then have it delivered in pieces and able to be erected in a way that uh, if you want to then change its function later down the track, you can take parts out and put parts in. And where it originally started was um, talking to um, the government in uh, Timor-Leste. Uh, they had a big um, building program. And one of the things that uh, was, how do you create dwellings that are sensitive, that are relevant to the community rather than just buying a flat pack house from any manufacturing uh, location on the planet and then delivering it and say live in that. Uh, it would be, it's about interacting with the community in a way that if you have a kit of parts then some of those parts might have been created locally. It means that it's fairly light and can be delivered in whatever size component you want to deliver it in. So if it's a site that's very remote from large construction, you can um, break the parts down, manufacture the parts in smaller parts and get them delivered uh, on smaller roads with less infrastructure. And the idea is you can go ahead of infrastructure and when the infrastructure comes, you dismantle that piece and then, into, then uh, rebuild that piece to then key into the infrastructure. If the infrastructure is relevant culturally, if it is important to... Um, yeah, so it's another whole long conversation, but that is um, that's that's the concept that we're working with, and we've had a go at starting a few of them. Uh, one of the com obviously complexities working in areas that don't have um, existing complex uh, construction industries is there's all sorts of other things that are nothing to do with the construction industry that get in your way, like uh, civil unrest. Uh, it's greatly interferes with progressing those sorts of things. So for me, that one is very much in the background because it's going to take the rest of my life for that to make any kind of sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm really intrigued by the business model you mentioned. That was a little, I feel like a little gem that we got there where you like to JV with different firms. Uh, help me understand that, that I understood it correctly. So when you get a project, uh, you pick a firm to JV with, and then what part do you play in that JV? Can you tell me a little bit how you structure that? I find that's a fascinating business model. Sure. Um, the way that I structure it from a business point of, uh, from a contractual point of view first, the less interesting bit, um, is we either set up a joint venture agreement or we subcontract to each other. Uh, and that's done in a way where the subcontracting arrangement is essentially not a public arrangement. The public front of it is we are working together in association. Um, and so that just keeps the liability legal side of things simple. Um, so if it's a larger project, we'll get a JV agreement written up. But if it's a smaller project, we'll just subcontract to each other because that's inexpensive. Uh, and then essentially, I have this wonderful situation where I kind of get to do the bits I like because I'm bringing the work to the business. And so then I get to be involved in the design, which of course is why I did architecture in the first place, be involved in the design side of it um, and get to con collaborate with some really interesting people on the design side of it. And then, uh, I, then I let them take the management load uh, because um, one of the things I discovered when I had children was that um, it's quite difficult to have small humans and be available to a large project from seven in the morning till seven at night. So what I like to do is have somebody else lead that. And you do need to find a way to put your own ego in the right place to say, yep, you're going to run with this. You're going to be in charge of that. And then often um, I've got a lot of my background is sort of uh, troubleshooting. Um, I have been 
described by others in the industry as the kind of architectural Mr. Wolf, where someone will come to you and say, I've accidentally blown this guy's head off in the back of my car. From an architectural point of view, could you help me fix it? So then I troubleshoot basically um, through the process and be the reference point if things start coming off the rails. And so check in with the project meetings, but otherwise um, be available to the team to guide them and assist them, essentially mentor them through that bit. Um, because I like that. I don't, I don't mind not being at the front. I quite like lifting from underneath and being able to go, yeah, you know, you guys do a great one because if you can give everybody that you work with this sense that they have capability and capacity and then support them in the, sometimes when they don't, then you get a spectacular results out the other end. It, it's really, uh, I find it much more exciting than being the person who was at the front. And I, I, no disrespect to people that like to be at the front, but I really enjoy that high tide raising all ships idea that, and I guess that sits underneath Park as well. Park, you know, wasn't really started as a business. It was started as a way to lift people in the, lift the industry up. And I think that some people lead by being at the front. I guess I'm leading from behind, um, helping everybody know how, helping them know how they can lead because actually that's going to have the biggest impact because I can be one person at the front shouting or I can be somebody behind lifting all these people up so that they can, you know, incrementally make better architecture you know sort of fred hollows one set of eyes at a time let's get you good at it and pop you out there let's get you good at it and pop you out there so yeah so that's the model i think i might have wandered off i on. love it no absolutely <laughs> fantastic uh, very fascinating i am really intrigued by that sounds absolutely interesting and i'd love it is some of our uh, hopefully some of our listeners see the benefit of doing that where if they can get good at bringing in certain kind of project types they can pick and choose the fun parts and get the opportunity to work with local firms as, as friends and not as competitors. I mean, it sounds absolutely fantastic. I love it. Yeah. I really enjoy it. It's great. Mm. Uh, concerning Park, you said it wasn't started as a business necessarily. It kind of happened to help support and be that uh, you have a heart for mentorship, I'm sure, being able to help and support people from underneath or behind, as you say. Uh, but has it been a profitable and successful business? Is that is that a yeah, I mean, it has in the end, essentially. I mean, um, it's a funny business. I guess it's it, it's what I call a compression business. It's gone one brick on top of the other brick because it wasn't, wasn't something that I was um, growing actively, deliberately. It was something that was on the side. I had, a you know, a big job and there wasn't a lot of room for it. But it just quietly got bigger and bigger and bigger. So now we see just a bit over half of the Australian graduates. Um, so that's a reasonably big group of people. And I suppose people from time to time point out a reasonably big sphere of influence, which is a little bit terrifying. Um, but that means that, um, so yeah, there wasn't, um, it, it is a business. What's great about it as a business is um, from a cash flow point of view, the money comes in at the beginning and every single business person will know that cash flow is everything. So it's wonderful from that point of view because that we, that um, means that, that, that the whole cash side of things is not complex. Um, it's gradually grown bit by bit through word of mouth. We don't actually, I hate to say this out loud on your podcast, you know, but um, we don't advertise. People come to us through word of mouth. And it is just a matter of, um, you know, people saying, I did this course, it was great, you guys should do it. And it's just grown over time from, you know, to a handful of people to, to a bit over half of Australia's young architects. So um, I, I would love to tell you I had some useful business advice, but honestly, it, it has been, um, I think what we've tried to do, it's been a very authentic business and a very personal business. So um, we, myself and the, the people that, are, that work with me in the business, genuinely wanted to be good. So we wanted to be 
um, we want every single person to come out the other end feeling like they've grown and learned and feeling, um, I think my one of my favourite comments someone made to me was a very substantially strong man that came up to me at the end of it. And I remember him well because he used to leave the tutorials and then go and drag tractor tyres as a form of uh, fitness. Um, so, uh, and he came up to me at the end of it and we always have a little celebration at the end and he came up at that celebration and said, do you know what's really great about this? I'm not afraid anymore. I can go onto a building site and I can talk to a builder and I know what I'm doing and I'm not afraid. And I just looked at this substantial man that was sort of blocking the sun, telling me that he wasn't afraid anymore. And I thought, ah, oh, that's what this is about. <laughs> and so I think that our genuine love for doing it and genuine desire for wanting to make it good for everybody um, is felt at the other end. And I think that's what helps uh, helps it grow. So Got it. That, over delivery. You did a, yeah, you did a great job of describing the uh, the emotional commitment you put into it, the authenticity of the program, how you focused on making sure that it's delivering the best results and then that spoken for itself as it's continued to grow via word of mouth. Uh, I'm curious with with the course, what what would you say is the secret sauce? Now, that may be an American term, forgive me, but you guys do have a very high success rate of people who pass the exam after going through, I believe somewhere around 90%, which is remarkable. We, we discussed sort of the, the, the non-tangible side, but on the more tangible side, is there um, particular techniques or way that you've structured the program that you think are really exceptional in providing that value? Um, I think that, the, that we you would know this yourself well that and you would meet people that do it all the time i think having people who are very good at communicating complex ideas in a simple way is very helpful i think starting from the base idea that all of the people you're talking to are bright capable tenacious people um, we make the candidates work really hard <clears throat> excuse me, we make them work really hard. We give them a lot of work. So the structure is that we give reading, then we do live content discussion of the reading. We give them sample questions in the style of the exam. Then we'll, then the next round we discuss those sample questions. Um, I'm incredibly uptight as a human being, which means I like things to be right. And as a consequence of that, um, we are... We, the information that we give is this relentlessly up to date as we can make it. It's always, so we don't um, pre-record things because we're concerned that they will become out of date. Now, again, from a business side, it would be much more efficient and profitable for us to record them and have them as a sort of self-taught thing. But we actually think there's something about putting the humans in the room together that does something, uh, become, there's a kind of camaraderie that's created. So um, we did some research long ago about how bright people uh, consume information and retain it. And one of the things that's tricky about what we have to do is it's not about um, learning the Latin names for all the muscles in the body. It's not flashcards at dawn. It is a lot of understanding of uh, legal, contractual, um, management machinery and then knowing how to operate that machinery in the way to make it do what you want it to do and manage risk uh, in the way you want it to manage risk. So um, we've got a lot of understanding that we need to get into people rather than a lot of rote learning. And we also, I guess we focus on the things that we know, we've done it for so long now, we know the things that candidates struggle to wrap their minds around. Not because they're not bright, just because nobody's ever explained it to them in simple terms. So as far as secret sauce, um, relentless kind of updating and attention to detail, uh, a gentle humour, I think, um, I th and an expectation that your audience is already really bright um, means that they come with you. I think it's a little bit of a hearts and minds exercise to say, I know this doesn't sound fun, but architects are also curious. So something that sounds like it's not very interesting, if you put it, um, 
put it to them in an interesting way, they're like, oh, how does that work? And so we actually have a rule about rabbit holes that if they find something really interesting and they look down the rabbit hole, we go, uh, uh, not, no, you've got to put the rabbit hole away for later. You can, if you suddenly want to understand copyright, that's great. Understand it this much, but later on you can pop down the rabbit hole when you're, or when you're an architect. So I don't know if that answers your question about secret source, but. Um, hmm. I love it. Where can people go to find out more about uh, about the course and about the work that you do, Nicole? Uh, so the the website for um, the course is practicingarchitecture.com.au, where you'll find it, or parktutorials.com.au uh, is where you'll find um, our tutorials. And um, I, again, unusually, I think it may be, it's a weird kind of Melbourne Australian thing, but I, it's part of my under the radar profile, I think. Enoch, no one, um, you, you've, you've successfully erased all traces of yourself across the internet. <laughs> I know. It's actually, and people are like, are you real? And we've heard about you. We're not sure that you're real because there's no thing in the world that says that you're real. And actually, um, that is quite deliberate. Um, and an alternative approach to being very visible is being very invisible. Um, and that is, I guess, uh, my point of difference. So... Uh, the people that I meet take me as I am uh, rather than as an imagined way of yeah, who I'm I love that. And it, it's a great object lesson in that there's there's many, many paths and many ways of being in the world, and uh, you can have success in any one of them, right? Um, so fantastic. And thank you for being on the show today, Nicole. Uh, really appreciate you coming on and sharing your expertise with us. Thanks very much for having me. It's been wonderful. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.